Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. I'm a soldier for Christ. I'm a soldier for Christ. I'm a soldier. No, they'll never take us under, because we're bringing truth like thunder. Raining on your speakers like a ton of bricks. Hold the cross high, cause we're Catholics. Fight the good fight with the truth, stand tall with the truth. I'm a warrior for Christ, I'm in love with the truth. Love God, save souls, slay error. Go stronger. Psalm 16, today at Mass. Keep me safe, O God, you are my hope. Alleluia, alleluia. Psalm 16 it has so much words of inspiration today. Terry and Jesse show. I'm uh, reporting for duty. My name is Jesse Romero, my partner, Terry. I, I'm sure he's on duty. Today. I am, Jesse. I'm reporting for duty. And this is going to be a very inspiring show, even though we have to talk about some crazy things regarding uh, you know, marriage and what is it, what, you know, same sex marriage has caused in our culture. But I think we're going to make you really think. But my favorite part of the show is going to be at the end. You'll want to hear it from a doctor of the church, St. Alphonsus Liguori, talking about penance and reparation and how that appeases Almighty God when these pandemics take place. And we have many examples. And I'm going to ask the question, what's different today than it was 400 years ago in the response? Well, what did the saints have to say about that? That's going to be inspiring for all of us. Also, I have Matt Arnold joining us for the first segment to give us some new information on some of our shows. So Matt will be here. Matt, are you with us right now? Not yet. Jesse. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear Matt. Yeah, Matt, we can hear him. thanks for joining us for this segment, Matt. I know you have a special message to give, but you know what? The first thing we always do on the Terry and Jesse show is read from the gospel of the day of Mass, daily Mass. So, Jesse, could you do that for us, please? Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Amen. John chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. Yep. Lifting up his eyes to heaven, Jesus prayed, saying, I pray not only for these but also for those who will believe in me through their word so that they may all be one as you father are in me and I in you that they may also be in us that the world may believe that you sent me quick comment. Jesus Christ categorically denies denominationalism Mm -hmm. as a foreign concept in the new Testament goes on to say, and I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one. As we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be brought to perfection as one, that the world may know that you sent me and that you loved them even as you loved me. Again, once again, Jesus Christ categorically rejects the idea of denominationalism. He knows about unity, one unified Catholic church. He goes on to say, our Lord, I wish that they were where I am, I wish that where I am, they also may be with me, that they may see my glory that you gave me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world also does not know you, but I know you and they know you that you sent me. I made known to them your name and I will make it known. And the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Only comment is there. Once again, we see the the interrelationship between the first and second person of the Blessed Trinity distinct, but inseparable, as all the creeds say. And Jesus Christ's great high priestly prayer calling us all to be one. One what? One holy Catholic and apostolic church. Terry. Well said, Jesse. And I also want to remind uh, folks uh, that the readings that you're reading, that we're reading from us were taken from the Missal of Daily Mass. So I would encourage everybody to do that. I'd like to bring the smartest guy in the room in through a, a locomotive train. That's Bishop Sheen. And just this t- talking about love. Bishop Sheen really says it's simple about love. He says, if one loves, everything is easy. If one doesn't love, everything is hard. And I think of that with a mother and a baby. Can you imagine uh, how that baby has been dependent upon that mother inside the womb? And then for the first couple of years, I mean, the mother is there for every need of that child. Well, there's an analogy, Jess. If you don't have love for that child, 
that's a pain in the neck. I mean, what? They're always getting up. You got to change the diaper. You got to do this. You got to do that. But when you love someone, it's a joy. And I even see that as a grandfather with my little grandson now. I'm changing diapers. I'm I'm holding him. I'm showing him trees. I'm I mean, all kinds of time of my time now is spent with my grandson. Why? Cuz I love him. Is it hard? No. I love it, Jess, and I know you've went through that also. And that's how life is. Matt Arnold, uh, I want to thank you for joining us on this segment. Sure. I, I want you have a comment about Fulton Sheen before you have your announcement because we've got time because I know you and I both love Fulton Sheen, but he says if one loves, everything is easy. If one doesn't love, well, everything is hard. What's been Has that been in your life experience also, like Jesse and myself? Of course. Of course. That's why, that's why uh, you know, the meaning and purpose of life is to know, love, and Amen. serve God. Because <laughs> if you know God, you'll love him. And if you love God, then serving him is a joy and not a drudgery. Exactly. Uh, just as, as you're, you know, when you talk about the uh, children and grandchildren. Yes. And, you know, agree 100 percent. Also, just quickly, when Jesse was reading today's gospel, something struck me. Sure. Uh, it's our Lord's pontifical prayer. It's the high priestly prayer. Mm-hmm. And he is praying for unity uh, in the church. But there's something really struck me that he said, um, I pray not only for these, meaning the apostles, but for those who will believe in me mm-hmm. <clears throat> through their word. And that's you and me. Yep. That's Jesus Christ praying for us yep. right there in the words of Holy Scripture. Sure. And it struck me that. Of course, uh, you know, St. Paul says in Hebrews that Christ is always before the throne of God praying for us and that he's praying for us now and that he is praying for us in the Holy Mass, even though most of us are not able to attend Mass when the priest is saying Mass every day. When they read those words today, that was Jesus Christ, you know, the person of Christ praying those words and praying for us. And so we have that great consolation that no matter what, that our Lord even if they were to take the Mass away, our Lord would still be in heaven making intercession for us. Well said. Amen. Well okay. Said. So that's just, I mean, that, that just hit yeah. me. Yeah. Um, and that's good news. Yeah. It doesn't that get is, any that better is, than that. No, that's the greatest news on, on yeah. That's right. <laughs> doesn't get any better uh, than that. But uh, and unfortunately. Yes. Oh, go ahead, Jess. No, that's it. Go, yeah. go Matt. All right. Well, I, um, unfortunately, I also have some. Some less happy news to relate. Sure. Uh, today we were going to have the uh, the premiere of Understanding Divine Mercy. Right. But I actually I, I had a discussion this morning with Father Chris Alar, and there have been changes in his life. Uh, and he he showed me a, a little note that I can share with you. Hello all. He says, due to unforeseen scheduling conflicts, I've had to adjust my calendar to accommodate the needs of my religious community here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. As a re- Result, I will unfortunately not be able to fulfill my duty as co-host of the Understanding Divine Mercy show on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. However, we are discussing ways to still be able to bring you this type of content in the near future. May God bless you, Father Chris Alar. And that's it. You know, uh, mm-hmm. as as Terry often says, life is full of adjustments. Yeah. And you roll with things. And of course, if you're going to be a, a priest in a religious order... <laughs> Uh, you know, he's under a vow of obedience, and if they've found something that they yep. reckon is, is more important for him to do right now, then then he needs to do his duty, and we support him Absolutely. in every way. I, but I, I just wanted, for those of you who were, who were looking forward to the program, and I came on this show not two, three weeks ago and did something I never do, which was to, to step aside from my usual very even keel to talk about how, how excited I was yes. about something. Now, I am, I am returned to my wonderful spiritual median, so I'm not going to be overly upset <laughs> no, no. <laughs> about not being able to do it. But it was something that was very much on my heart to do. And, uh, and I just, as a, as a parting shot, we, uh, somebody on Facebook the other day, one of our concerned listeners, mm-hmm. uh, wanted to let us know that there were priests and folks out there that have an issue with the divine mercy and that they think that, that it's problematic somehow. Mm-hmm. And uh, it brought up the fact that it was on the index of forbidden books once upon a time, back in the 50s. And that's true. And the problem is, of course, that they, they don't mention that it was also re- removed from the index of forbidden books yeah. <laughs> when, when new information came to light. Unfortunately, in Poland in the 1930s, you know, in 40s, it was, it was almost impossible to smuggle anything out because of, you know, the draconian nature of the communist government there. Sure. And so the Italian um, translation of Faustina's doc- diary that had been made, you know, uh, hastily and under duress had some um, bad translations in it. That's right. And when when uh, they were able to get the original in Polish, they discovered that those problems didn't exist in the original. 
And so her diary was rehabilitated. She, her cause came up, and actually the cause for her canonization was already ungo- ongoing when John Paul II became pope. So it's not like he just decided, apropos of nothing, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forget all those bad things that the people said and just make her a saint on my own you know, uh, authority. In fact, that work had already been done. Well said, okay. And And f- final thing, I think, like so many times, you, you don't see it coming. I think St. John Paul was prophetic in his promotion of the Divine Mercy and in the institution of Divine Mercy Sunday, because obviously he doesn't know that they're going to, you know, close all the churches at Easter sometime. Right. But it happened. And the Rosary and the Chaplet of Divine Mercy are those two things that, that lay people can always access. That's right. You know, no matter what happens uh, to the church, we have access to those things and those special graces um, that they provide. Well said. And just one more thought I just want to mention. It was a couple months before Pope John Paul II was elevated to the pontificate that the Holy See made those adjustments and said, yes, uh, it is worthy of devotion, the divine mercy message of Sister Faustina. And it was John Paul II who was working with the Holy See at that time. I just find it interesting. And one last thought. When Sister uh, Faustina was beatified, I love this, that St. John Paul II said it was the happiest day of his life. Can you imagine that? Wow. Matt, thanks for the update. One one, one more thing, Terry. One more thing just to throw into the mix. Because you say this, it just struck me. Yeah. You know, uh, John Paul was at Vatican II. He was one of the sure. authors of Gaudium et Spes. That's he was right. involved in Lumen Gentium. That's right. Um, you know, and, and the decree on religious liberty. You know, pretty much the only country where those decrees were actually um, taken into account by the government is Poland. Wow. And let's look at Poland as the only country that has, you know, uh, proclaimed Christ the King in our modern times. Wow. All right. God bless. We'll be right Thanks, back. Pat. God bless. Talk to you soon. Listening to the Terry and Jesse show, <clears throat> stick around. Don't turn that down. You don't want to miss, miss what's up next. Leviticus 11.44 says, Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. St. Vincent Pilati said, You must be holy in the way God asks you to be holy. God does not ask you to be a Trappist monk or a hermit. He wants you to sanctify the world and your everyday life. May God show us the path to holiness and help us to follow it all the days of our life. Welcome, Daniel. You're on the line. What's on your mind, brother? Hi, I just wanted to share a testimony about Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I had a buddy at work who, you know, he's a lukewarm Catholic guy, and I wanted him to start listening to the Terry and Jesse show, so I kept telling him to download the app, and he kept putting me off. So one day, I grabbed his phone, and I downloaded the app (laughs) for him. I went on vacation, and you know, I kept telling him to listen to it. He was kind of put me off. I came back from vacation. He comes to my cubicle, and he says to me, Hey, man, I've been listening to Terry and Jesse's show, and it's great. And it's uh, made a big impact in his life. The guy, he's going to weekly adoration a couple times a wow. week. He goes to the Mass in the morning. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he's an on-fire Catholic, and he promotes the Terry and Jesse show on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Daniel, what a testimony, and I want to encourage our listeners to get those cards by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, do what Daniel's doing. Go out and spread the faith by inviting people to listen to Virgin Most Powerful. Daniel, thanks for your testimony, brother. God love you. You're welcome. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877 877- Five four three three eight seven one because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888 888- 
Now, here's Terry and Jesse. Venerable Fulton Sheen, pray for us. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us. When you unhinge yourself from what the church has taught for 2,000 years about marriage, and when you introduce an anything-goes definition about marriage and family life, you get confusion. And confusion comes from the diabolical. I'm looking at an article here. It says, the happy thruple. Those are three people. Three people. I guess in, in some type of a marriage arrangement. And this is becoming more and more modern. It says, while the supporters of same-sex marriage dismiss claims from critics who predicted that once the Supreme Court opened the door to same-sex marriage in Obergefell in 2015, it would only be a matter of time before polygamous marriages would begin to be normalized. And although there are still laws against polygamy, polymorous marriages are already being celebrated on mainstream cable television, in the media, and in the entertainment industry. Polymorous marriage is a, it's a, a relationship between three or more people living in a marital situation. They made a brief debut in the halls of Congress when the openly bisexual California representative, Katie Hill, proudly promoted poly, polymory before she resigned under a cloud of an impending ethics investigation over campaign finance violations. And the once conservative HGTV, the same network that brought us the much-loved Fixer Upper, featuring the joyful evangelical family of Chip and Joanne Gaines, is now promoting what the producers have called a throuple, that is, a man and two women in a romantic relationship who are searching for a new home with a room for three sinks in the master bathroom. This is being promoted on HGTV's House Hunters as, quote, there's not a crowd in Colorado Springs, close quote. And the marketing materials describe a throuple in need of a new home for their growing family and, and, the, and the promise of plenty of excitement. And so in the interviews, <clears throat> this newest female, female member of the throuple, that's three people in a Polly Morris relationship, a love relationship, living as, the mar- living as they're married, this throuple, buying a house together as a throuple, will signify our next big step as a family of five, they said, rather than all four of them plus me. I didn't plan on being in a relationship with a married couple, but it just happened very naturally, organically, said uh, the actor in, in this show. Well, maybe not naturally, because there's nothing natural about a marital throuple, about three people in a polymorous relationship. Catholic teachings, as well as the teachings of all the major religions, are clear on the sanctity of marriage between one man and one woman. And this relationship being portrayed by this new show on HGTV, it's portraying, let's just say it, it's, a, it's an adulterous relationship. Violation of the Sixth and Ninth Commandment. And yet, HGTV, this once conservative channel, portrays the throuple as a regular family with children in need of a new house. And we learn that the husband and the relationship always knew his legal wife, Lori, and she was bisexual. And, uh, and we learn that he was always perfectly fine with, w- with that when he says, quote, this has nothing to do with church and state. It's a commitment between the three of us. We are all equals in this relationship. Wow. Jesse, when I'm listening to you, I'm going, okay, what planet are you on, brother? Because, I, you know, when you and I grew up, if someone would have told us this, we would have said, are you kidding me? That's not going to happen. That's crazy. But you see what happened once we redefined marriage, Jess? Anything goes. We're hearing people getting married to their computer, to their dog, uh, to you name it. And you see, what happens is when we forget about our meaning and purpose of life that Matthew talked about earlier in the first segment, once we get away from that, you see how crazy we can be, Jess? We can start getting married to anything we want. And, you know, here's the bottom line. It shows me how sick the culture has gotten. And that's why evangelization is so critical right now to give people the meaning and purpose of life. Those folks 
Guess what's going to happen to them when they get tired of that? They'll try something else. What then? What then? Yeah, they'll just add, they'll just keep adding more people into this relationship. Exactly. Four, five, six. Right. Yeah, it's, they it's, want because they want sad. they get bored. They want diversity. That's, yep. that's yep. their. And and also Terry, I, I just remember once upon a time. Yeah, tell me when the Catholic bishops they actually had control right. over what was produced in Hollywood. That's right. That was there was a golden age of Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Where the the Catholic Church, along with Jewish rabbis and, and Protestant ministers, yes, the Catholics they formed a network, and it was called the uh, oh, shoot, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, it, the, it was the Legion of Legion Decency. Of Decency yeah. Legion Sorry, of looking, Decency, yeah, Legion of Decency, and it was around for about thirty years, Terry. Yeah. And this is when the Catholic Church was robust, and the Catholic Church would actually sit down with these producers and directors and say, "Nope, that doesn't pass the muster." Right. Yep. We that's that kind where of you power. can release that. Terry, that's gone, and now we have the devil, in my opinion, who's the CEO of not all Hollywood, most of Hollywood production companies, yeah. and this is exactly what he's trying to do, is trying to poison and redefine marriage in the minds of people. Why? Because Sister Lucia warned us. She says the final attack of the diabolical before the, the, the second coming of Christ will be against marriage and the family. And we're seeing the devils using media mm-hmm. uh, exactly to try to confuse the issues. And Jesse, I want to go back a little further to the time of, of when birth control was an issue until the 1960s when the pill came out. And, and many people just said, OK, well, you know, it's going to stop abortions. It's going to do it's going to be good for the family. And I'm going to point out that all this pornography, all of this same sex marriage, all this stuff comes back. We, because we forgot about the meaning and purpose of our sexuality. We took the love and procreation and separated it to say sex is just for fun. It has nothing to do with bringing forth new life. And once we did that, anything goes. And so I'm going to make my point is, everyone, read Humana Vitae, Pope Paul VI's statement in 68 that said traditional teaching that you can't separate life and love. And so we have the procreative aspect of marriage and we have the unitive. You can't separate the two. And what the culture has done right now, just like people going to the gym to exercise, they're treating our sexuality as just fun and no responsibility. And so what happens? We look at the culture now. So let's go back to the way God designed it. And people are going to be much happier. And that's why we at Virgin Most Powerful, Jesse, I don't want to hear your personal opinion. I want to hear what God's Word teaches, what the Catholic Church has taught for the for 2,000 years. And this is the answer the world needs. But what's the difference right now? I'm going to be honest with you, Jess. We don't have enough zealous souls in the church hierarchy and us lay people. We've, we have basically have become um, set into the culture, and we don't think any different than the culture. So how can we influence them? Do we have bishops right now calling out and saying, this is wrong? I wish we had more bishops saying this. I wish we had more bishops saying, you know what? Abortion, no way. You can't vote for any abortion. Any person who votes for abortion, I would. I would hope to see more bishops come out and say when they're asked in public uh, television. My own local bishop here in Southern California. Well, what do you think about same-sex marriage? And he says, "Well, well, you know, we were lost that one, and we're going to let it go." No, we can't let sin go. We have to say we stand for a certain point. And Jesse, when you do that, you know this for years. We pay a price for standing up for the truth and not bending because someone says, hey, uh, you know, you got to make an exception here. No, we don't make exceptions. You know why? Because sin you know, is sin. I'll tell you why this has happened. And Bishop Athanasius Snyder said it in a recent interview. Go ahead. He says, because we have a lot of fake shepherds. I'm just going to be honest with you. Okay. That's that Bishop. And by the way, that was yesterday's first reading at mass. We have a bunch of fake shepherds within within the fold. That's why. Because what's a bishop's job? Teach, Teach govern, and, govern sanctify. and sanctify. Well, guess what? The leader of all the bishops is the New York bishop by default. They, they consider him like there's a, there's a term that they call the New York bishop cardinal. Mm-hmm. They call him the Pope of America. That's yeah. kind of a, a Catholic yeah. colloquial term. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? The Pope of America, Cardinal Dolan, he's on record saying in 40 years, I've never talked about birth control from the pulpit. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah. Maybe I should start. So I'm, I'm just saying. Most people have never he- heard, a clear, he- uh, heard a clear teaching of the Catholic Church. I never did till I went to this thing called the Catholic Family Conference 
If I didn't go on my own and spend my own money and decide to invest a week and to learn my faith, I would have never heard it from a pulpit. And, and so all I'm others. just saying, all I'm just saying is that most Catholics, through no fault of their own, they've never heard the clear teachings of the church. Trust me, uh, because as Father Frank Pavone says, the average Catholic pulpit is silent. There's a prophylactic in that pulpit. It's a contracepted message. You're yep. not getting the fullness of the truth, Terry. And which goes on to the second point. Yeah. When you deviate from the church's teachings on marriage and family and love and life, you have what, what we have here is called solo gammy. Yeah. These are women this is that horrible. are marrying themselves. Yeah, this is... Are you kidding me? Self marriage. These are women. I never thought that would happen. That are proposing marriage to themselves. They're dressing up like bridesmaids. Yeah. They're finding romantic lo- locations. They're sending engagement announcements. They're hiring a celebrant. They're sending invitations. They're buying expensive outfits. They're doing everything yeah, that he, a bride would do, hey, and they're marrying themselves. You forgot one more thing. They kiss the mirror looking at themselves. Are you kidding me? Yes, it says that in the article. Jesse, here's the point. The bottom line is people, we have a catechism of the Catholic Church I'm holding up. Please read the section on marriage and find out what it's really, the real teachings are. Because so many Catholics over the last 40 some years I've been involved, Jess, just like yourself, Catholic family conferences, they come up to me and say, I didn't know that the church taught this. Wow, nobody told me. See, and that's why we have big mouths. I'm telling you right, Jesse, God gave you a loud voice for a reason, okay? He gave me a loud voice. And it's not to call balls and strikes as an umpire. It's to proclaim to Jesus Christ's good news of the gospel in season and out. And that's what we do here at Virgin Most Powerful. Yeah, so these two examples here, the, the throuples, three people living at, in a mar- in, like, like of their marriage, and self-marriage, this is all a result of Obergfell versus Hodges in 2015. When the liberal U.S. Supreme Court, top-heavy with liberal progressives, when they redefine marriage, now... They just redefine marriage as if you love somebody. That's all. And so now this opens the def- the secular definition of marriage to all kinds of abuses, and we're seeing it. Three people living in a polymorous arrangement, they call it a marriage, and then people marrying themselves. We've seen other times, we've done other shows, people are suing to marry their animal. People are suing to marry their computer, their, te- right. their technological gadget. Uh, and uh, again, there's... Uh, the, the the caboose has been unhinged, Terry. Yeah. Unless we go back, and again, uh, the Bible is very clear. The first pope says, "Judgment begins in the household of God." Well, what does that mean? It means that the household of God, the church, is going to be judged for the sins of society. Why? Because the church is the moral conscience of society. Jesse, when one generation tolerates sin, the next generation will embrace it. That's the bottom line. We have to stop this. When we come back, we're going to talk about the seamless garment or a political comforter. You're listening to the Terry and Jesse Show on Virgin Most Powerful. Hi, this is Jesse Romero from the Terry and Jesse Show, also from Jesus 911. Let's face it, we all need to use the internet, but we need screen accountability. Why? Pornography is a huge problem, especially on the internet. And every time we tap into the internet, we get bombarded with images and temptations that degrade our humanity. So we need Covenant Eyes to block these pornographic sites and advertisements from infiltrating our lives. Covenant Eyes helps us take custody of our eyes and custody of our intellect. So I recommend you go to CovenantEyes.com and type in the promo code, the NPR, to support the network. Protect yourself and your family from the eminent threats on the Internet. www.CovenantEyes.com Code VMPR Live Porn Free. Thank you for listening to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Thank you. God bless you. Keep the faith. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com 
and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. The seamless garment oh, has provided political cover mm-hmm. for uh, Catholic progressives and Catholic leftists, Terry, for the last 30 years. That's true. In the 1970s, you have the late Joseph Cardinal Bernardine and his Episcopal allies. They advanced the notion that Catholic politicians should not be judged only or even primarily by their position on abortion. Right. Because abortion uh, was merely one strand in a rich and finely woman seamless garment of Catholic social teaching and defense of life, according to Joseph Cardinal Bernardine. He said that numerous other issues ought to be considered. And so this the seamless garment thesis in a recent editorial by the National Catholic Reporter distor- <clears throat> distorter. Go ahead. Provided its list of other issues, which included when it comes to voting, we should also think about as kind of equal to uh, abortion, war and peace, mm-hmm. immigration, tax cuts, housing, the death penalty, economic justice, welfare reform, the federal deficit, civil liberties, education, health care, crime and on and on. The idea seems to be that a good Catholic uh, is going to, is only a liberal Democrat. Ba- basically, if you follow Cardinal Bernardine's way of thinking to its logical conclusion, mm-hmm. and that was surely not the bishop's intention in the 1970s. It probably wasn't, but many have drawn that inference, Terry. Yep. And I'll tell you, here's what... It, there's so many poorly formed Catholic politicians, and this is where it leaves us right now. Right. A lot of them are indifferent to abortion, but they need political cover to support it. And so in that respect, the seamless garment argument has been a spectacular success. Why do I say that? Just ask the 71 Catholic members of the House and Senate who regularly defend the right to choose abortion. Jesse, say that one more time, because I think people are shocked to realize our Catholic representatives are saying 71 of them are for the killing of unborn babies. What? This is an unmitigated disaster. Absolutely. An unmitigated disaster. And I'll tell you this uh, in, in every other respect, after watching these Catholic politicians, you know, they, they try to like, you know, oil their way around the issue. Yeah. Uh, the laity have concluded that the seamless garment thinking hasn't demanded much from us either. You know, it's made Catholics very lazy to think. Yep. And so they say, well, here's the argument that these uh, Catholic senators in the House and, and, and Congress are using and stuff. So I guess that's okay with me. Mm. So that's why the Catholic opinion on abortion today, Terry, isn't much different when you look at the polls from a secular humanist mm. opinion. Yeah. Because effectively, the seamless garment, by equating the gravity of abortion with diverse other issues that are that are obviously less important, uh, Cardinal Bernardine, he's undermined the teaching authority of most of the bishops on these serious moral questions right. because they always go back to, Hey, you know, Bishop Strickland, Hey, the seamless garment, the seamless garment. Right. And so these Catholic office holders and their supporters, they've, uh, they've been granted a free pass on abortion because that's their, that's their card, Terry. That's the card that they play all the time. Seamless yeah. garment, which is not a Catholic teaching. In no. fact, I'm glad to see that Archbishop Gomez 
recently came out thunderously. That's right. Uh, and said the seamless garment theory is not Catholic. Thanks teaching. be to God. Yeah. Yeah. Jesse, also, we remember uh, John F. Carey, who, you know, has this motto. He says, I'm personally opposed, uh, but, uh, you know, I want people to have abortion rights. You see, that doesn't go very far before the throne of God. OK, you can't say that. <laughs> and you know what, Jess? I remember back. Well put. <laughs> Just saying it. <laughs> you laughing. It doesn't go well before the throne of God. It doesn't, man. <laughs> and here's the point, Father Cardinal O'Connor. John O'Connor was the Cardinal of of New York. And Jesse, this makes you, this is probably going to make you laugh, brother. But back in the '80s, I was recording a priest retreat with Cardinal O'Connor. Father Benedict Rochelle was there. It was a great weekend. I hired a gentleman to do it. I flew him out from California, and. um he recorded, and so I listened to the priest retreat, and I said, wow, this is interesting. They were talking about this, the, 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 uh, the um, seamless garment of Cardinal Bernadine. I said, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, and he, the Cardinal O'Connor says, Cardinal Bernadine called me the day before he was going to release his statement on the seamless garment, and he asked me if I would support him on this. And I said, no way. Are you kidding me? I, you're way off on that. That's not Catholic teaching. And so they got into this argument. Now, he's telling the priests of his diocese this story. And then he looks over. I, didn't, I assume he goes, hey, we're not recording this, right? And the priest says, oh, no. Well, my guy had still was recording. That's how I heard it. So here's my point, Jesse. This seamless garment 30 years ago was not well received by Orthodox bishops. And thanks be to God, Father Cardinal O'Connor stood up and said, no, this is not true. Well, here's, here's the bottom line. This seamless garment is still being used today, just, you know, and, and many bishops are still going to that. But you know what, Jess? Truth never changes, okay? So uh, 500 years from now, if someone brings up the seamless garment, it, it'll, be tr- it'll be false then. And so all I'm telling you that story is that we need more bishops, like I say, to speak like Bishop Strickland and others, to say, or like Archbishop Gomez, This is not Catholic teaching. We need clarity right now with charity, and that's what we try to do here. I mean, Jess, we don't have a a pick with Cardinal Bernadine. I hope and pray that he repented of that before he died. I really do. Now, whether he did, that's up to God. Absolutely. Goodwill for him. I don't want anybody to go to hell. His teaching was false. And that's what we're here to say because I don't want to lead people astray. I know that, like I say, before the throne of God, I'm going to be asked the question what did you teach? in your life? What did you li- how did you live in your life? I don't want to give somebody false teaching. So purity of doctrine is very important to both of us and our network. That's right. And uh, the article says, quoting Kerry, John Kerry was running for president and Kerry just used Ken- Kennedy's line and all the Catholic left in politics, they use the same line. You know, they'll say, I'm personally oh, opposed. give me a break. But, okay, and I like the way the article they is... go to hell on their right, butt. Yeah, yeah, crisis writes here. They say, 30, that's where 30 years of seamless garment teaching has brought us. Yep. As the bishops have, with notable exceptions, seemed paralyzed by John Kerry's you know, aggressive behavior, here's a modest proposal. When John Kerry, when he was running for president, and when he declared his personal opposition to abortion... Why doesn't a bishop write him or call him or give him a public letter right. and ask him what he possibly meant by that? He should ask. He should have asked Kerry and all these other Catholic sure. politicians like Joe Biden. Ask him, is abortion wrong because it's morally wrong, in fact, or only because his faith tells him it's so? So clearly, Kerry and other Catholic politicians, they cannot embrace the, embrace the, the, the first alternative because if someone says, that he's a personally that he was personally opposed to slavery, but supported its legalization, he would be seen at once as a hypocrite. He'd right. be run out of office. So one cannot claim, as Abraham Lincoln famously noted, a right to do a wrong. That's right. It sounds like St. Thomas Aquinas. Exactly. Yeah, personal opposition in this case means no opposition at all. And and Kerry and other Catholics and politicians that embrace abortion, uh, again, they've embraced the second alternative, but uh, he has also said that in a secular polity, Catholic moral teaching can have no binding effect on his conscience. Kerry and other Catholic politicians have said that, that when it comes to politics, that their faith 
can't have any influence on their conscience. Yeah, they That's what the Catholic the left holds, Terry. Yeah, yeah they separate they bifurcate. their faith and their reason. But really, because let's face it. And you it. can't, Terry. No. Because St. John Paul II, he describes faith and reason as a bird with two wings. Exactly. And if you cut one wing off, the bird can't fly or it's going to fly in circles you, on the ground. You nailed it. In order for the bird to soar and go straight and go high, yeah. uh, it has to have both wings, faith and reason. And so, uh, again, this is this is this is a huge problem. But, I, you know, I'm going to give credit to somebody who gave us a lot of moral clarity on this. And he really simplified the argument. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carl Keating from Catholic Answers. Oh, yeah. He's uh, he's no longer part of Catholic Answers. He's been retired for years. But he started Catholic Answers. And under his command, he put out a little booklet that it was a voting guide. It was a, it was called a voting guide for serious Catholics. And in there, yep. he made this whole seamless argument. He destroyed it. Uh, by just making a giving a clear teaching about negotiable issues. That's right. The five and non-negotiable, non-negotiable yep. issues. When I saw that here like twenty years oh, ago, fantastic. It was like wow. I, this uh, this whole seamless garment argument it just fell apart. It crumbled when you look at there are some negotiable issues that we can talk about. Yeah. Uh, immigration, education, med- uh, uh, healthcare for everybody. We can discuss that. We can have policy differences. And then Carl Keating says, but there's non-negotiable issues. Those are the sanctity of human life and the sanctity of marriage issues. Those are de fide. Those That's come right. from the word of God. That's the highest form of teaching for us as Catholics, God's word. And so when Carl came out with that, he paid a price for it. Oh, yeah. The Catholic left went after him. And even, even the political left went after him. And I know he found himself in court fighting just to keep that book. And that's why he ended up getting some other nonprofit status to maintain that book. But I give him a lot of kudos Absolutely. for giving us clarity and destroying the seamless garment <laughs> argument by giving us the understanding of negotiable issues and non-negotiable issues that Catholics must, must adhere to. Well said. I want to remind everybody tomorrow, Steve Ray will be on our show talking about his virtual pilgrimage and telling us how that's all going to work on June 20th. That's a Saturday. It's a free conference. You can get it by going on to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. And don't forget the week before that, Jess Romero, Ruben Nava, and Tim Gordon will be here for the Catholic Men's Conference. And that will also be a virtual conference on the computer and on our app. And you're welcome Here, to Give the to, people the date. What the date, date is, is the 13th, the week before Steve Ray. 13th of June is, is the Men's Conference, and the 20th of June is the Steve Ray Virtual Pilgrimage. Much more, just go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Jesse, when we come back, this is my favorite part of the show. I'll tell you why, folks. Because I love reading the lives of the saints. They inspire me. St. Alphonsus Liguori is going to talk about what happened when there was a severe drought and how he got the people's attention by going to confession, by repenting, and preaching the Word of God and converting people back. Maybe we should do that now in our time. That's what we're going to talk about on the Terry and Jesse Show on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. We'll be right back with the good news. In Luke 7, Jesus said, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven her, because she has been shown great love. According to St. John of the Cross, Christians should always remember that the value of their good works is not based on number and excellence. Their value is based on the love for God that prompts them to do the works. May we always be motivated by true love for God, and not worry so much about what we do, but why we do it. Tummy. How does the baby eat? Can the baby hear me? How did the baby get in there? Wow, a pregnancy can sure generate a lot of questions, but what's important is that a baby is a baby inside and out of the womb, not just after birth, but nine months before. 
at conception. That's right, every baby is a miracle. Hello, my name is Marianne Kuharski. I'm the director of Pro Life Across America. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro Life Across America, please visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org or better yet, simply dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say the keyword pro life. Pro Life Across America is non political and totally educational. A baby's heart is beating 18 days from conception. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. Psalm 16, keep me safe, O God, you are my hope. Today's Amen. responsorial psalm. Terry, the shield of faith. I love the stories of the saints. Did you know that St. Alphonsus de Liguori, <laughs> doctor of the church, moral theologian, he brought an end to a severe drought by exhorting people to do penance and to make reparation to God for their sins. He didn't say, wash your hands, put on masks, <laughs> and very, stand six feet away from each other. Very right? biblical. Yeah, and he prophesied the exact day the rains would return and how he tamed a Vesuvius eruption. We'll, we'll just go back and forth on this. Let me this read the first awesome. paragraph. I love it. From the life of St. Alphonsus. For almost six months, the town of Nocera had been in great distress for during all that time, the sky had been as bronze as in the days of Elias. And not a drop of rain had fallen on the parched earth. Were the drought to continue a little longer, it meant the ruin of the crops with consequent famine for many. The people wept at the thought of the future. And St. Alphonsus wept over the sins of the people, which are the cause of such scourges. Weak though he was, he was 83 and infirm. Yep. He organized one Sunday, the 15th of May, a penitential pr procession to appease the anger of God. Robed in purple, sprinkled with ashes, and with a cord around his neck, he set out with his religious for the parish church, preceded by the cross. The distance being considerable, he was obliged to make part of the journey in a carriage. But no entreaties could prevent him from doing the second half, supported by two attendants on foot. Kind of reminds me of Moses had I know a, it. Caleb and Joshua on, on each side. <laughs> exactly. Carry the article says. Jesse, let me just say this. Picture this, what Jesse just read. No, if you're not driving, picture this picture. years old. Terry. Man, he's an old guy. And Jesse, he's got more fire than most. Okay. Oh the whole town was present at that touching ceremony, and the church with the square in front of it, of it was thronged. The holy, uh, the holy, holy man determined to profit by the occasion. And this is what he did, Jess, and this is what we need to be doing right now. He to exhort sinners to repentance. Wash your hands. Yeah, no, exhort sinners to <laughs> get out of here. That's the difference of us in 500, 400 years ago. The pulpit was moved down to the door of the church. Why? So that the out, those outside might be able to hear his words. And as he was unable to ascend to it by himself, again, Jesse, I could just see you helping him pick, pick him up. He was born into it on the shoulders of a number of big dudes. Okay? For an hour, he raised his voice. Jesse, to wash your hands. No. Wow. To, he, he said this, raising his voice against what? Mortal sin. It sounds like he'd wow. fit right in with the uh, virgin most powerful, which he said not only offends God, but often de uh, draws down the most terrible chastisement. Did you hear that, Jesse? I got it. God has reason to chastise us, he exclaimed. For we have deserved it. I have deserved it more than all. But spare the innocent, oh my God. Have pity on those poor little ones. Men and women wept. Jesse, check this out. Men and women wept and asked for forgiveness for their sins. And soon all the confessionals were filled. Jesse, they wept. You know what we're doing? 
Get get I gotta go and get some more cleaning uh, solutions. Come on, not penance. See, this is why we're getting Hanna, more wipeies, Terry. Yeah, more, more wipeies. We have a everything super, has to be wiped down. Yeah, everything supernatural. Has to be. Now I'm gonna wipe everything down in the church, folks. Don't don't think that I'm not gonna do that. But you know what? Let's talk about what really matters is our salvation of our soul. But Jeff, Jesse, let's continue on. Yeah. Where, but heaven says, what? But heaven seemed deaf to the appeals of the afflicted people. Eight days passed. And no change took place in the sky. While St. Alphonsus continued to break and to ask for the prayers of others also, on the Monday after Pentecost, May 24th, he was returning from his drive when just as he reached the monastery, he suddenly ordered the coachman to turn back and take him to the Church of Our Lady of Grace. The people, seeing him leave the carriage, gathered in the church to pray with him. The saint asked to have the statue of Mary unveiled and exhorted those present to appeal confidently to her all-powerful protection. Then he turned to them and said with confidence, Continue to recommend yourselves to the Madonna. Go to confession and communion this week. On Sunday, you will have rain. I love it. I love it. Jesse, all through the week, the sky maintained its pitless blue sky sunday brought no change ho oh, and the people began to whisper that this time the saint was no prophet when suddenly towards evening a complete change took place the heavens became covered with clouds and the rain fell in such abundance that all the fields were flooded as for the servant of god on seeing the rain fall he was covered with confusion and said to those around him People will take the promise I made for a prophecy, but the words only escape me. I am anything but a prophet. Just this is so real that I think we forgot about our supernatural view on our life right now. When you read the lives of the saints, you ask, you ask yourself, wow, these men and women had faith. I really question a reason why we're in such bad shape is we have very weak faith today, Jess. Terry, and also something interesting is that authentic prophets and mystics like mm-hmm. St. Alphonsus de Liguori, St. Mm-hmm. Father de Pio, they never, they never go around no. telling people, hey, I'm a prophet, no. I'm a mystic. That's when you and know right they're now, not. right now, Terry, you find all kinds of people on the Internet, Catholics. Uh, oh, uh, Jane Doe, the mystic, uh, go to this website. She's going to tell us when the world's going to end because yeah. of the coronavirus. Oh, go to this website. You know, Tom Jones, another Catholic mystic, of course, self-proclaimed Catholic He's going to tell us why this happened, where it happened, and uh, when it's good, things are going to be restored. We got so many phonies right now on the internet, and we got so many Catholics running to and fro saying, Jesse, look at this website. Look what he's saying. Look at this website. You know what? Let me tell you something. Here's the criteria. Yeah. Once somebody calls himself a mystic, that just, you just, know that they're not. That's what the saints have told us. <laughs> yeah, Jesse, <laughs> that's 500 years old. I know saints, when they went out and did investigations that the Holy See wanted to find out, they called, knock on the door and they say, hey, I'm looking for some guy who said he's been seeing the Blessed Mother. And, uh, and the guy answers the door and says, yeah, that's me. He says, thanks, have a great day. And then leaves and says, there's no way, because he wouldn't say that. See, that's why we have saints. They're very, Terry, they're very reticent. People that have these visions, they don't want to tell anybody. No. They're reticent. They're not going on the Internet, giving talks and saying, I'm a mystic. Listen to what I'm saying. Here's when the world's going to end. Yeah, it's, it's fake, fake, fake mystic. Okay, three months later, on August 10th, 1779, the community of Pagani oh, witnessed great. another wonderful phenomenon, yeah. which seems more than a coincidence. For some time past, Vesuvius, which dominates all that area, had been pouring fiery lava over the district of Otaniano. Mm-hmm. The entire neighborhood was in consternation. One evening, especially, the flames rose to such a height as to excite the apprehensions of some terrible catastrophe. The fathers contemplated the splendid but fearful spectacle from the windows of one of the corridors. Filled with terror, related Father Dominic Corsano, I ran to the cell of the servant of God. I love it. And begged him to come out and see what was going on. <laughs> he came drew near the window, and then started back in fear, repeating three times, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Wow. Then in my presence, St. Alphonsus of Liguori made a great sign of the cross Mm -hmm. in the direction of the mountain. And that very moment, the immense whirlwind of fire and flames appeared into the... Disappeared. Disappeared, yeah. Disappeared into the crater. Yes. Keep going, Jess. This story... Brother Brother Leonard Cicchetti makes a similar deposition. (laughs) He says, Brother Francis Romito, yes. Alex P- 
Polio and I yeah. led the holy old man, St. Alphonsus of Liguori, to, to <laughs> one of the windows that he might see the flame, which rose to a prodigious height from Mount Vesuvius. He made the sign of the cross, and the flame instantly disappeared. I love it. All we saw afterwards was the smoke. Thus, did God exalt his servant, be, his servant before king and people alike, and even before his own spiritual children? But alas, these months of favor were to be followed by the most terrible trials. It was the calm before the storm. The oasis were in the divine providence permits the traveler to enjoy a moment of repose before he plunges into the sands of the desert. Or rather, it was as the Palm Sunday of his master which preceded the Passion. When we think of the events which are to follow, we would like to close the story of our saint here. Did we not know that the life of our divine Redeemer want on the true crucifixion? St. Alphonsus, an imitator of Jesus, in his hidden and active life, was destined to go through a dolorous passion and climb the hill of Calvary like his Lord. Thus, by a mystical crucifixion to die to the last remnants of human attachment and self-love and make perfect forever his union with Jesus in heaven, St. Alphonsus Liguori, Bishop and Doctor of the Church, pray for us, Venerable Fulton Sheen, pray for us, Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us, St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, Pray for us. Well said, Jesse. I read these stories when I was in my 20s. And any book, go to Tan Books, get the the um, Life of uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori, get the Glories of Mary, the Passion and Death, all these great books of St. Alphonsus. He has tons of stories. That's why I like to tell stories, because people remember stories more than your teaching. And so I want to encourage you to look up St. Alphonsus Liguori. He actually lived to become, he's only 90 years old before God called him home. But, man, he never gave up. Jesse, when you're 81 years old, oh, I hope God. you've got that kind of fire, brother, and I hope I do, too. Just, just to— Terry, uh, go yeah. ahead. Terry, here's the last, and, and by the way, these are the books, Terry, that yeah. at this, a lot of modernists, they have contempt for them. Oh, they hate They what, say, oh, come on, Terry, Jesse, you actually believe that? You think that, that actually happened? That's crazy. Yeah. You guys are— you, Oh, you guys really need to go and take a course and— <laughs> Science and biology, exactly. that stuff can't happen. Exactly. Are you kidding? And, and again, just to, uh, truth be told, yeah. that's where we're at. See, a faithful Catholic like myself and Terry, we actually believe that miracles happen. Uh, every we day. believe that God has mystics and prophets, Amen. even today. Yes. Once somebody says you're a mystic and a prophet, that disqualifies them. That's because right. you know who decides who's a mystic? Guess who, in case you're wondering? The bishop does post Humously, after they die, yep. after an investigation, the bishop will say the local ordinary, how it with works. the authority of an apostle, will say, St. Father de Pio, he was a mystic and a prophet. They don't declare that while he's alive. This is post-death. So when you see on the internet, come to hear my talk, I'm a mystic, you know that's fake. Because only a bishop can proclaim that you're a mystic and a prophet post-death. Well said, Jess. Hey, uh, five points of King David. Hit him real quick. We always Number want one. Him. Yep. Pray the rosary every yep. single day. They can't, the government can't take the rosary away from us. Yeah, they can close down the churches. They can't take the rosary away. Nope. Number two, may, pray every day. Call upon our Eucharistic Lord and spiritual communion. Number three, read the Gospels every day. Read your Bible. The government can't take away your Bible. Number four, penance, penance, penance on Fridays, Wednesdays and Fridays if you want to go old school. The government can't stop you from doing penance. And confess your sins to God every night with a good act of contrition. The government can't stop you from doing that. All these five stones, Terry, the government can't stop you from doing them. Don't make excuses. And we have two priests here in confession at the Sacred Heart Chapel on Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Join us. And Jesse, what state should we be living in, brother? State of grace. State of uh, Not in a state of mortal sin. And remember, as St. Faustina says, that we're on a great stage right now. All heaven and earth are watching us. Fight like a knight. Amen. So Jesus can reward us. God bless you. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests O my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole church, grant it love and the light of thy spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great high priest, may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, 
which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin most powerful, pray for us.